Hello, uh, good afternoon or good evening, and uh, welcome to uh, the next session of uh, Pivot 2021, which is uh, project finance, business models, financial incentives, financial instruments and incentives. Uh, my name is Tim Lyons, I'm the moderator for this session. And a bit about me, uh, I've been in the energy industry for about 40 years and worked in about 40 countries. Uh, at the moment, my main uh, uh, purpose is uh, structuring and raising deal finance, both in the oil and gas sector and the geothermal sector. Uh, but I'm also involved in asset valuation, uh, resource, resource reporting and engineering. Uh, and uh, I'm a director of a firm called Oilfield International. Uh, and also Black Bear Energy, which is an oil company. I trained as a petroleum engineer at British Gas, and uh, in, a, in, a, in a parallel career, I led the uh, European Commission's development of district heat policy and legislation uh, for the 13 Central and Eastern European countries uh, back in the late 1990s, when those countries were joining the, uh, the European Union. And I was also the energy policy advisor to Romania in the early 90s for the European Commission. And my role covered electricity, district heat, uh, coal and energy efficiency. And I'm a past chair of the Society of Petroleum Engineers Distinguished Lecturers Committee. Uh, and currently I represent the SBE in its geothermal and its data science initiatives. So a little bit about this session. Um, I just want some broad remarks is that uh, mining for water, uh, very similar to mining for oil and gas, uh, with one exception, which is that uh, it's not worth so much, possibly only a tenth. And, uh, and therefore projects uh, tend to have much lower internal rates of return or much higher capital costs to get to the same rates of return. Um, but they have similar subsurface risks. Uh, many of, with some of the technologies, many of the risks are the same, permeability, uh, subsurface uh, porosity, uh, fracturing, etc. cetera. Um, and this causes a problem because if you look at the, uh, the duty of private equity and public equity, it's to maximize uh, return on equity for a given level of risk. Uh, and indeed, this often referred to as the efficient frontier of return. So for a given level of risk, how do you maximize your rate of return? And in that respect, geothermal is generally not competitive. And there, therein lies the challenge or one of the challenges we're going to try and face today. Um, and the way I articulate this uh, as a general remark is how do you de-risk the geothermal project life cycle? And why is that important? It's because if you think again of the equity, it's looking for to maximize its return for a given level of risk. And therefore, if you lower the risk to equity, then they can accept low returns. And a similar thing applies to the debt. And we've got a couple of debt specialists on, the, on, the, uh, on, on our panel tonight. So in essence, what I'm hoping this session will do is see how best we can satisfy the debt and the equity, which will be the principal providers of large scale finance for geothermal in the future. So the objective of this session is to, is to try and share geothermal finance experience from around the world. Uh, and within that uh, sharing to discuss what initiatives have worked, what financing ideas have worked and generated uh, profitable returns or sustainable returns. And also to try and understand what gets in the way. Uh, what, what, what is it that, uh, that means so far as equity and debt are concerned that they're, they're not interested in, uh, in a wholesale commitment to geothermal uh, energy, whether it's power or, or district heating? And then what can each actor do to help the process? And to give you an example, um, you've got multilaterals and government uh, uh, offices. Uh, there are various things they can do to, to, in, uh, to incentivize or ease the way for private sector equity and debt to get involved. Uh, and the private sector itself can both use the techniques that are already familiar to it, both in the oil and gas sector and other sectors, but also look to how we can innovate specifically uh, to de-risk uh, some of the uh, life cycle uh, to, in order to make uh, uh, these things more financeable and more attractive at scale. So 
that's in essence what we're going to try and do in the next uh, in next hour. Uh, and what I'd like to do now uh, is uh, in turn give our four uh, four guests uh, a chance to give them a brief introduction, and then I'll and I'll talk to you about the next stage. So first of all, I'd be delighted, uh, Elin uh, Hasgrim Dottish, to uh, provide a, a brief introduction to yourself and uh, what it is you do at the World Bank. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you, Tim. Uh, my name is Elin Hallgrimsdóttir, and I'm a senior energy specialist at the World Bank. I work uh, in a global unit called Energy Sector Management Assistance Program, or ESMAP, uh, where I lead uh, two geothermal programs. One is focusing on geothermal electricity and one in, on geothermal direct use. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering, and prior to joining the World Bank, I worked as a geothermal consultant for more than 20 years. So I think that is a brief introduction to me. Thanks. Yes. And of course, you're an engineer, so you know. You're yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so next, uh, perhaps uh, Ivan Das from uh, Rebo Bank uh, in the Netherlands, uh, you'd like to say a few words. Hi, Tim. Thank you. Thank you for having me over. Um, I'm Ivan Das. I work at the Rabobank for over 25 years now. And the last 12 years, I'm at the project finance department and I'm mainly involved in renewable energy financing. And the techniques I cover are, the bulk is solar. It's really hot now in, um, in our country and uh, nearby, of course. But also biomass conversion, various biomass conversion techniques. And of course, last but not least, geothermal energy. Whereas in the Netherlands, until now, we only have direct use projects. So quite different from the most of the rest of the world. And by direct use, you mean what district heating for uh, industry or, or uh, residential purposes? That's right. Yeah, yeah. This, district heating until now, mainly for greenhouses. So in the horticultural sector, we are now uh, progressing towards district city heating. But that is not much easier than uh, than the, the conventional district heating in the horticultural sector because of a lot more stakeholders and um, some challenges on the permitting side. No kidding. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry to say so. <laughs> okay. Uh, Katie uh, Truer from uh, Goldman Sachs, a few words from you. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me uh, here today. Uh, my name is Katie Truer. I am a vice president in Goldman Sachs's investment banking division. Uh, I work in a group called Project Finance Infrastructure and principally cover uh, project finance in both the US and Latin America. Uh, very active in power, renewable, transportation infrastructure, um, and you know everything project finance. So very happy to be here. Cracking. Very good. Very interesting. Yeah. And so and you said and South America as well as uh, USA. Yeah, so US, yeah, yes, yeah, US and Latin America. Very interesting to compare and contrast those in due course. Okay. Uh, and uh, Julian, Julian Richardson from uh, Parhelion Insurance, um, uh, the last but not least. Hi, Tim. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm the insurance guy. We uh, are a boutique insurance business focused on how we can use insurance capital to de risk investments into sustainable and climate compatible development. Uh, we've been working on uh, geothermal for well over 10 years, and we developed a, a solution to underwrite resource development risk uh, to complement debt and equity. Insurance is an important part of the capital structure, and I look forward to telling you a little bit more about that. I am actually a, uh, someone who's already priv pivoted from the oil and gas sector. Uh, I spent my first uh, 15 years in the insurance industry insuring oil, uh, oil and gas companies. Uh, and now I work on the other side of the uh, uh, energy and environmental uh, spectrum. So you've gone to the light side, I suppose, is what they're say. Indeed. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you all. Um, okay. So the way um, I would like to uh, structure this, uh, this this part of the conversation, other than as I've already told you that effectively you're at my place and we've just had dinner, uh, is that um, uh, is to allow you to introduce yourselves, or rather your experience. Uh, and I'll give you some, each one of you, a fairly open-ended question, uh, which you can interpret in any way you like. Um, but as is normal in a, you know, a, a dinner conversation, then yes, by all means, be on your soapbox for a few minutes, but expect others to pitch in and you know, have a little debate or an argument what you have to say or share their own experiences. So try and make it as much a natural conversation as, as possible. Um, and uh, so I'd like to start with uh, you, Elin, uh, World Bank. 
And uh, the question is, um, uh, what has the World Bank done to enable and incentivize geothermal power and heat production? And how successful was it? Yeah, thank you, Tim. Uh, maybe I'd like to start by saying that multilateral development banks provide top one channel to one channel for delivering public finance support in low to middle income countries. And financing is primarily made available in the forms of grant and loans below market rate in below market interest rates. Did you just uh, say low, low to middle in, uh, countries? You mean in income? Yeah, low to middle income countries. All right. So you're not interested in. Uh, North America and no, okay, it's no. It, I mean, the World Bank and most of the multilateral development banks are focusing on the low to middle income countries okay. when they are providing because they provide funding in grants and loans, as I said, below market interest rates. Right, uh, but there are plenty of countries within that that have geothermal resources, like Africa, Latin America, Indonesia. So you know, there are Turkey, for example. So there are which are in this low and middle income, income rate. Yeah. Uh, but maybe regarding the enabling, then in 2013, ESMA launched a global geothermal development plan to shift the support from downstream to upstream geothermal development. And in 2015, the, the GTDP, as it's called, had raised 235 million US dollars for, through clean techno, technology financing and which leverage further 1 billion US dollar in World Bank lending. This uh, resulted in that multilateral development bank in the geothermal sector financed for financing for upstream geothermal development increased from 6% from 1975 to 2012 to 39% in the year 2013 to 2020. Sorry, Elaine, did you say that the 230 odd million dollars, is that grant funding then? Yes. Okay, which is why then you've got a lot of, you can get a lot of debt behind it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. But yeah, but this was, you know, these are projects that are already in operation today or are on their uh, final, uh, final, final steps. So as a result from this, we have established 240 megawatt online, and we have a further pipeline of 600 megawatt, hopefully in Indonesia, as a result of this. Uh, leveraging of money. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. No, no, I was going to say, and that's and who owns that project? Is it is it the government of Indonesia or is it private sector? How does that work? So, for like in Indonesia, they have been establishing this uh, risk mitigation faci uh, facility or GREM, I think it's called, where the government will uh, support. Uh, both private and public entities with uh, risk sharing. So they loan money to the projects, but if the resource development or if the resource exploration drilling does not succeed, and there you need to come to a conclusion what is uh, success, then part of the funding will become grant. So they share part of the, of the risk, and there is a difference if it's a private or is it a public. We also have a, a risk sharing mechanism in, in Turkey, where only private companies can apply, uh, where it is the same similar setup is that you agree on a set of, uh, of uh, what is a success. And if the, if the resource is not as was, was expected, then part of, of, the, of the loans become a grant. Sounds like an insurance product. I mean, it is, of course it is, it's a risk sharing. Uh, so it, it does, does the same thing, except, you know, it focuses only on, uh, on, uh, on specific, you know, amount, and it's not always, uh, it's usually 40% or of the initial cost. There is also in, in Africa, there is also a, a GRMF, it's called, the Geothermal Mitigation Risk Facility, where both, I think, public and private uh, companies can apply where it is only grant. They, there's, uh, they, you can have grant up to a certain amount. Uh, it, it is not related at all to, to the success. So there are out in, in out there there are several uh, facilities available to de-risk, so to say, 
uh, some are larger and where private and public entities can uh, can come into, but there are then other like projects within multilateral development banks that focusing on a single project where it is not like these facilities where you can have multiple projects applying for uh, for this uh, risk sharing. So there, there is this two kind of uh, well, the bank has been uh, involved in. To, to, to put it politely, are your clients uh, capable of all the various, uh, I don't know, requirements or steps to take to get to the stage where a, um, a project like this is uh, is financeable and can be approved by the World Bank or any other bank for that matter. So, you know, the, the technical work and presumably there's some sort of an agreement to buy the power, all those things. How how does, uh, can you help with that? What's the... Um... So, I mean, big portion of what the bank does is uh, capacity building and uh, assist them in building up these uh, either hire somebody that knows what is needed to be done or build up the capacity within them. Within these I, I have to say, I remember that when I was at the European Commission, we all used that word capacity building. It took right. me a good three or four months to understand what the heck it would look. What, is it, what do you mean? You mean making people more capable than they were? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, learn by doing or uh, teaching them or, uh, you know, assisting them in education and or assisting them in hire somebody that can do, as I said, what is needed to be done. Fascinating. Anyone else want to pitch in? Um, I'm hogging the conversation. I, I'll chip in, Tim, if I may. You know, I, the the scheme that was set up in Turkey actually came from some of the original work that Parhelian did uh, on behalf of the World Bank and the IFC, looking at the risk barriers to geothermal production uh, and moving those projects forward. <clears throat> so we came up with this concept of a sort of resource risk guarantee um, that was uh, adopted in Turkey and that now we are moving it, mobilizing out to the, uh, you know, through the private sector insurance in industry uh, and more broadly across the world. So, um, you know, from our point of view, we're, we're sort of geographically agnostic, but geologically specific. So we can work in uh, many different countries, developed and emerging economies, um, and, and take those risks. And I think the point you make about the capacity building, Ellen, is really important. And Tim, to point that out, uh, Ellen referenced the GRMF in East Africa, which is a geothermal risk mitigation facility. Uh, and unlike many facilities, it's had its some successes and it's had some criticisms. But one of the things it has done really well, it has uh, implemented a certain rigor in the project development process uh, and enabled projects to, or, or, you know, sort of force them to follow a well-defined process, uh, bringing in all the expertise necessary to develop good geothermal projects. Um, you know, the, the resource is one thing, but the way it's developed is quite another. Uh, and having that expertise um, is really important. And it's something that is, that is often lacking in, in some of the projects we look at. Uh, we do wonder, do the projects have the capability to see it through to the end? Do they have the technical expertise and understanding? And it, it, it's not sufficient just to say, well, well, we'll buy in the expertise because you also have to be an informed buyer. Um, uh, it's not good enough to to simply think you can buy it all in. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I think I mean we we can carry on on that, but let's try and broaden the conversation a bit. So I want to bring in uh, Raber Bank, so uh, Ivan, uh, and uh, I'm aware that Raber Bank's been in been involved in this for at least two, 20 years. So why don't you uh, tell us some of the experiences you've had, Ivan, or indeed corporately you've had about uh, two, two, 20 years of lending to geothermal district heating projects. Hi, thank you, Tim. Uh, well, our, um, our experiences are in fact, um, thanks to oil and gas, because Shell and Exxon have drilled a lot of wells, thousands of wells in our very small country. And that is why uh, we have quite some good data about the subsurface. And um, that makes that, uh, uh, since this data is for, to a large extent, also 
publicly available makes uh, has, a, has an effect that we have quite some wells drilled just for geothermal energy. And because our government um, uh, sponsors the, uh, the extra cost of the renewable, uh, the renewable energy above uh, in our country, it's mostly natural gas. And there's a quite stable subsidy incentive um, for the development of, of this direct use project projects in our country. And um, what we have learned is that the rest at first, in the beginning, uh, a lot of people advised us that um, because everything goes well in Paris and in Munich, everything will also go well in the Netherlands. But now about 20 years later, maybe 15 just, we experience that our country is, is in a delta. So uh, some rivers, building all kinds of sediments, which makes that our water and also the water quality is quite different from the water in the Paris Basin and also quite different from the water in, let's say, the, the Rheingraben and, uh, and other, um, other areas. Um, and that leads, unfortunately, to quite some challenges at this moment because in the third years, we, well, we ordered casing and we put the casing until about over three kilometers depth. And now a lot of these casings appear to be not, yeah, not of sufficient quality. So there's a lot of, of working over going on in our country, uh, mainly for uh, yeah, GRE, so composite casings, inner tubes to keep these wells intact. Okay, so you're getting massive corrosion of the uh, of, of your of your your steel tubing. Tubing. Yeah, it, it differs from uh, from area to area. Yeah, but indeed, uh, corrosion is really um, uh, an issue at the moment. Yeah. Okay, what's yeah. the temperature of the water at the bottom of the uh, uh, in the resource, roughly? It varies from about sixty degrees Celsius until ninety two, is the highest one. So it's pretty aggressive fluid. If even at those low temperatures, you're cutting through the casing. Yeah, it, it is. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, and what surprises me now you say that, because you're saying a lot of these wells were repurposed from uh, Shell's uh, development programs? No, the repurposed, that's, that's where we uh, are talking about now. Oh, I'm, and I'm these, these dry wells or, or empty well, yeah, or, or wells that, which, which were not successful when drilled um, can be transferred to geothermal. But no, actually, it is the data we have. Yeah. Because we have all these data of thousand wells in, in, in yeah, just a small country compared to, let's say, the UK or Germany. So, yeah. Okay. So, but, so uh, if sorry. I look at the, uh, I mean, your job is much more, much broader than geothermal, isn't it? I mean, you, you said you covered almost every renewable sector and some I hadn't even heard of. That's right, so, yeah. So when you, uh, when you're putting your, your, board, your board paper together, you know, uh, how does it differ where, for a geothermal project uh, to your board than, say, I don't know, one of the other renewable uh, energy sources? Well, there are three main topics. Um, the first one is that you're working subsurface. So you are working on, let's say, P50 models and P90 models of the expected energy deep down below. And from a bank perspective, we were used to a P50 and a P90 in wind and solar, but this, um, this probabilities were measured sometimes from years before the project started. And, and yeah, subsurface, there's no, uh, no ability to first test what the energy capacities are down there. So, the drilling is also, yeah, the proof of the pudding. Let's put it like that way. There is no test drill possible because it's a very expensive technique to drill. Um, so that's, that's a very important issue. You never know what the megawatts are da deep down there compared to wind and solar. I, Another I, issue I, is... Sorry, Ivan, I can understand why it's... Uh... But this is the same as oil and gas, isn't it? I mean, basically, we, we, we drill the wells, we drill exploration wells, we drill appraisal wells, and we do well tests and other, and we log them, and we calculate uh, a range of potential uh, uh, deliverabilities, oil and gas in place, 
yeah. and recoverable reserves from those. So presumably, despite what you said, you're you're not you're not at the very end, the expiration side of this business, are you? I mean, presumably the delineation has been done before people call you up and say, "Can I have some money, please?" Well, we are called before the drilling starts off. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. so we, we also share in the risks during drilling. Sometimes there's enough e equity until the first well tests. But uh, there are some, some examples where we all already are financing during drilling of the first well. And um, we can only do that because of our governmental um, insurance product, which takes out the insurance of reaching or not reaching a P90 scenario. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And another, yeah, another different from, from solar and wind is that um, direct use is involved in heat. And instead of electricity, heat cannot be placed on a national grid. So you always have to look very nearby okay. where you can, let's say, sell the heat. And, and that's so, yeah, also, um, yeah. It's also more complex than, than, than the conventional techniques like uh, solar and, and wind. And uh, yeah, the, the, the last topic uh, in our my top three is, is permitting site. Permits take a long time with a lot of stakeholders. So it takes, it takes yeah, it really takes years before you can, um, you can order a drilling rig on site. Um. So from the equity perspective, presume you've got equity partners, then you're saying to the equity people, sorry guys, you're gonna to have to wait uh, some years before we're even gonna start production simply because of permitting? Yes, permitting is, 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 yeah, is, is the most important time issue in the, in the whole setup indeed. Is that just the Netherlands? What is that, who anywhere else got any? Hello, it's I've got a shaking of a hand from Eden. <laughs> it's everywhere, permitting regulatory framework it's always uh, i would say that is one of the biggest barriers that's crazy yeah and and it's more difficult since tim, tim you started off of saying that compared to oil and gas the value of hot water is is yeah nowhere compared to the value of oil and gas of course so that's also uh, an, an important risk factor of course yeah yeah, that's right. You you don't have the, you don't have any uh, uh, any room to maneuver because uh, because ultimately there's there's so little value in the product that uh, if if you get it wrong, you know, yeah. And how long do you uh, rent? Sorry, someone. I, I didn't, uh, sorry. I, I was just going to jump in. I mean, there, that brings up an, an another interesting distinction between geothermal and solar and wind, where the resource risk for solar and wind is is much less than you have in geothermal. But ultimately, the the product here is is power and or or, or hot water is, um, is a distinction to oil and gas where um, there's a lot of value in the commodity. Most, uh, most equity or, or developers make the return in contracted solar and wind projects through the use of leverage. But because of the resource risk inherent to geothermal, you, debt capitalization uh, supported by those projects is less. So it's an interesting, um, interesting dynamic that comes into play. Are you can I just under, uh, just tease that out? Are you saying that the amount of debt that a product can sustain is considerably less? It, yeah, it's less for it to, for uh, two two primary reasons. One is is resource uh, is the resource risk that we've been discussing. I mean, solar uh, now is is pretty highly predictable. Wind generally considered to be less predictable than solar, but also you know more predictable than geothermal. But geothermal, you introduce the risk um, that you know you could have a seismic shift underground that kind of cuts things off and sustained underperformance, and right. that risk is, is considerably higher than in a solar project, for instance. Um, the other way that that comes into play is you know renewables are generally financed um, based on contracted cash flows under a PPA. So the PPA offtaker may not uh, you know want to sign up for, um, or the, the project may not want to sign up to a PPA that, you know, is at the full capacity of power that the project is capable of, of producing because of uh, volatility. And so you may have uncontracted cash flows that are not able to support as much leverage um, than if it had been fully contracted under a PPA. Yeah, and that's it's also, can... it's oh. also a timing thing, Tim, you know, the, the ability to get debt into the structure um, you know, you can get it in right 
very early on on wind and solar projects. But of course, with geothermal, you've got a lot of equity is needed to finance uh, the resource development. And without, you know, that's a high cost of capital um, that, that is purely used. And you can't bring in debt until you've got the proven resource and the, the, the license to extract it and the PPA and all that stuff has to be equity finance currently. And even the equity uh, finance is kind of unattractive because there is always that low probability, high impact risk of coming up with nothing. Yeah. On the subject of which then, can I just ask about what, what uh, Ivan, would it be too rude a question to ask what a typical coupon is for uh, your debt piece and then for someone else to say what typically would the equity want in terms of equity return? Ivan, if it's commercial information, don't tell me, but I, I'm just wondering whether you can give us a, a steer on it. Well, since the uh, yeah the, the capital markets uh, interest is, is quite low at the moment, um, for debt, I'm, I'm at this moment, I think you are in a range of, let's say, 250 basis points until 350 basis points for, a, let's say, a 10-year fixed interest. Yeah. Right. Okay. And so, what about... Quite low, I guess, for now. Yeah, really. I mean, you'd be you'd be lucky to get that on a reserves-based loan uh, for uh, for an oil and gas piece. What about the equity? Can anybody pitch in without divulging any confidentialities? What what the kind of equity returns people are demanding in this industry are? I would guess uh, looking, you know, high twenties, thirty percent. So unlevered equity, no, levered equity, uh, levered equity returns of of, of high twenties. Is, it, yeah. is there any, is there any uh, kind of uh, agreement on that? Is that the kind of number that anyone else? That, that seems seems pretty chunky. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, maybe indirectly because our government um, is very afraid to provide state aid, so to cross the international um, regulations regarding uh, giving too much aid to companies, and in that mechanism and all kind of theoretical uh, financial models about a, a kind of, um, yeah, let's say example projects, all kind of uh, assumptions where you can discuss for months. But in these models is a kind of a minimum equity return yeah. of 15 until 18%. But I more agree to Julian, that's, that's really not sufficient for this, this technology. So I'm, I'm more, more in the, the 20s or 30s okay. you need you need to um, to counterbalance for the risks uh, that are there but did yeah. you mean by that 15 to 18 a min and a max are they are they, are they trying to uh to, to, to yeah that's a kind of rate yeah range depending on the the, the type of standard okay. product they define okay Okay. Project, let, let me park that. I know there's so many things coming. I just want to, make, to to bring other people in formally. So, so Katie, um, I don't know. Which, ask a question of you. Um, um, so, what types of risks are the project lenders willing to take, and uh, what would you say fall under uh, developer equity risks? Yeah. So I I would kind of bu bucket it into um, yeah the, the two, and then me, you know maybe potentially a bucket of risks that no really nobody is uh, willing to take. But I generally, I would think that the developer is responsible for, you know, field studies, drilling in the field, doing test bores, and getting a good idea of the flow rate and the temperature. And some of that work may have already been done by uh, governments who have done field studies, which can be leveraged, leveraged as well. Um, you know, generally contractors won't take those risks, but they'll come in once the resource is known. So that's kind of phase one. Banks would come in at a later stage once, you know, after a contractor is willing to come in, after an offtake uh, contract and an EPC is in place, lenders are going to want to have the pro want the project to have, you know, permits, land entitlements, uh, resource reports from someone credible for the engineering, and you know, they'll look to run sensitivities and they'll want to have a high level estimate for, you know, the cost and the energy potential. So kind of long-winded way of saying, um, you know, banks will come in at a, you know, late stage development or pre-construction um, type of stage uh, for the financing. Isn't it interesting that you, I mean, you're definitely talking from a private sector perspective, but Ivan, I think you were saying something unusual, which obviously was being uh, supported by your government, that you'll come in earlier. 
Yes, there's a, a governmental insurance product because the commercial insurances, insurances um, are, as we believe, are not happy to pick it up. Is a product where for a premium of 7% of the expected drilling costs, you can take, a, take out an insurance where you are insured for not reaching the P90 in the reservoir. Yeah. And um, there is your, yeah, or your own risk is, uh, is then 15% of these drilling costs. So you also always have a, an, own, an own equity risk above that, the 50% you can insure until yeah, the P90 not being reached uh, for 7% premium. So your government, in the, and let, to be specific, has decided that a way of opening up this sector is to, de is to de risk the front end by yep. providing. With, so, extraordinarily, in my experience anyway, for banks to come in as early as that, uh, especially when you're only seeing three and a half percent coupons, um, and therefore, you know, you're, you, you, you're not covered if you lose, lose money in a in a, in a, in a yep. Yep. The interest. Okay. So one of, one of the challenges, one of the challenges when the private sector evaluates, uh, you know, government incentives, and you know, in it, in the U.S., if you look at what is there for solar and um, you know, solar, wind, other renewables, you know, if you have renewable energy credits, SREX, REX, LCFS, RINs, things of that nature. Katie, you'll need to spell them out because we're not we're not all. <laughs> we're not. Uh, like you know, low carbon fuel standards. Um, SREX are solar renewable energy credits. So, you know, these are these are credits that have a, a floating, they, they have a floating price. And so banks, and if you were trying to get a deal rated, um, you know, these are these are incentive programs. And now you know, depending on the type of incentive um, and the tenor of the ultimate financing, there can be a lot of questions around are these incentives going to last through different political regimes? Are they going to last, you know, if you have a financing and a PPA that is 20 years. 20 years long, you know, people will do a lot of, uh, run a lot of sensitivities on the values of those, uh, particularly at the curve, um, because it can be a large uh, question mark about whether those things are going to endure over time, particularly as more renewables uh, come online. That's a, that's a pretty crucial risk, isn't it? I mean, if you can't trust the government to, uh, to, to keep its word for long, a long enough period to allow the thing to become sustainable, then they're almost like uh, they're putting they're putting a, a barrier up. No, I, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that, actually, Tim. But we we get a lot of inquiries to actually underwrite that change in regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, it's an important but a subtle distinction between you know political risk. It is policy risk. Um, you know, governments uh, only put in policies for uh, you know four or five years at a time. Um, they they can't they they don't want to put in a policy mechanism that's there uh, forever, or even if they do put it in forever, there's nothing to stop a future government coming in and changing that. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't matter what they legislate today, there is always that policy and that regulatory risk. And again, that's something that we've been asked to look at a lot in the uh, um, uh, insurance industry, where we've developed the specific solutions for, for these. They're very bespoke, and they're not easy to do, but it is an important part of that financing mechanism. I think actually, Julia, maybe I should ask you anyway, what, what are, what risks can the insurance industry take to try and uh, roll out uh, these projects or help, help them roll out better? Well, the, the one we've been focusing on for, for some time now is that resource development risk. Um, we did a study well over 10 years ago on behalf of the World Bank to, to look at the, you know, the, the risk profile uh, at different stages of the projects uh, in development. And the one that is most unique to mm -hmm. geothermal is that resource development. So what we've, uh, what we've done at Pahili and what we promoted to the World Bank and then uh, to continuing to develop in the private sector and, and indeed working with other sort of multilaterals like the Green Climate Fund and, and others is to put in these insurance schemes that, that puts a floor on the downside for the equity investors. So Ivan's already referenced a, a uh, government scheme uh, in the Netherlands and, and, and there have been other government schemes you know, in France and elsewhere that have looked to address that. But the insurance industry is, you know, it's a $2 trillion pool of capital um, that can be mobilized. And if, if Ivan's talking about a 7% premium rate, 
that that looks pretty good to me. I'm not sure you actually need a government to, to be writing that. Um, you should be mobilizing the private sector capital. And it's, it's interesting to say, you know, what is the role of that public sector capital and how can we mobilize the private sector? Um, so maybe where, where the project developers are faced with, you know, do we get debt? Do we get equity? Do we buy the insurance? Perhaps one of the roles is for the governments to make premium finance mechanism available rather than taking the risk on their own government balance sheet. You know, why would they want to do that? They, they, they can lend the money to the projects to, to buy the insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and that becomes a very efficient way of using public, public funds to mobilize uh, private sector to, you know, uh, support this industry. I get um, it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and let's just look at the, the reason why the, the, it, it's an insurance type risk rather than an equity type risk. It's because, you know, once you're looking at that resource development, understanding, you know, as you say, the upside downside is very different to an oil and gas uh, um, project. Um, but there is always that l low probability, high impact risk that you could undertake your drilling program and come up with nothing. Now, that low probability, high impact risk is fundamentally unattractive even to, to equity investors because, you know, to an equity investor, breaking even is really a failure. The, the risk of capital impairment is fundamentally unattractive uh, and, and, you know, enough to walk away from. Um, but low probability, high impacts, that's the kind of risk that the insurance industry takes. And so using insurance capital to underwrite or put a floor on the downside from a drilling program allows, changes the risk profile for the equity investor. It means they have that known downside. It reduces the risk of that capital impairment. Um, and, and it uses the right capital to take the right risks. I've got a, when you, when you talk, this sounds to me like the equivalent of, you know, maybe a large oil and gas company looking at, say, 20 exploration prospects. Now, they wouldn't go to an insurance broker or an ins insurance company in the first instance. They simply say, OK, we will farm out part of these, uh, the working interest in these uh, 20 pr prospects. We'll drill them all or we'll drill most of them. And we'll rely on our, our sophisticated subsurface understanding to work out geological chances of success and the, uh, the P90, P10 uh, uh, spread of, uh, of, of potential resources. Now, so this does pick up on a point that I discussed with Katie, which is whether the, the type of institution that's, uh, that's, that's developing the geothermal project influences how it's financed. I mean, Katie, can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of, if you look at solar and, and wind projects, usually the, de I mean, if frequently the developers, um, you know, don't have the capital resources to, de to develop these projects on, on balance sheet. And so really uh, many developers, you know, get the project to, to FNTP or to kind of a pre-construction stage and then, and then sell it. Uh, large oil and gas companies may have the resources to, um, and the skills, as, as you say, to, um, they may have the subsurface geotech skill to evaluate that risk and be more comfortable with it. And then they might be able to, you know, fund development or even, you know, they wanted to be the final, you know, equity owner, they might have the resources to do that on balance sheet. And that's not something that is commonly seen um, in solar and wind, though changing a little bit now that larger corporations are interested in, you know, building and owning and developing large solar and, and wind projects. Can I, can I understand? So are, are any, any of the big oil, or any of the majors actually doing what we're saying, which is looking at a large, a significant number of geothermal projects and saying, okay, this is just a different category of exploration project to us. The exploration department can handle it and we will allocate capital in the normal way. So there, I think you run into the challenge that we were talking to where you kind of have mismatched, uh, you know, you don't have the same equity upside as for a geothermal project as you have for an oil and gas type of project. And what Julian was talking about too, you could effectively use an insurance product to make the equity investment look more like debt where you're protecting your downside there which is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Look at it. Yeah, yeah, it's but, a deep inequity, yeah. But I think also, I mean, there is a, a gap. I see always a gap. I mean, like most of the facilities that are out there to de-risk 
are for exploration drilling, which is not for all of them. But then many of the private investors, they have difficulty to finance the remaining drilling. And many of the, of the financing institutes, they are requiring that you have already drilled 110, 20% of your steam or energy available before you can get some uh, financing. I mean, where, so where does the de-risking end and where does the private sector take in? I mean, it's very important of them for the government to know if they are doing a de-risking. How far should they go before the private sector is willing to come in and, and do the remaining? And so that's a very, I would be very well, interested yeah, I mean, in that. You heard before what people are saying. I mean, I think Julian said that he, or I can't remember who it was now, said that they were thinking the equity returns in the 20s or even the high 20s. Now, you know, I, I finance oil and gas projects at 22% typically um, unlevered uh, equity returns. So I am sorry, I've never heard even of a geothermal project that delivers so much equity. So well, then maybe your answer to your own question, which is that unless we can get, uh, you, you said at what point did the private sector take in? Well, if it's not profitable enough, you know, let's go do something else. I mean, re real estate, you can get 20% oh. rate of return easily enough. So, yeah. so you're saying, well, we're back to saying, well, we, which I'm, we've, we've got this project, which isn't very profitable. And we know that the huge global benefits of rolling it out as a base load power supply. What, what is it we can do to magic uh, to a sustainable private sector development here? Um, and the answer might be none, but, but that's what, that is the whole essence of this is it's not profitable enough. And so well, it's about the cost of cost of capital, Tim. You know, if you have to finance everything through equity right up until you, you can get to the you know the the project finance bit of building the topside plant, yeah. um, that's that's a challenge. But if you can reduce that cost of capital by you know using insurance to make it more debt like, or even bring in debt, as Ivan is able to bring in debt to his project because he can rely on a government insurance scheme, if you you know. One, we would certainly expect to see, you know, with the use of our insurance mechanism, it makes it easier for equity to come in, but it certainly would enable debt to come in at that point. And that is a huge changer for the cost of capital. Absolutely. So can I ask both Ivan and Katie, what, what uh, proportion of... Uh, of the, if you like, the, the construction cost after the delineation phase, what proportion of that would you fund? Yeah, I mean, I think it really, dep it really depends on, um, you know, the PPA and, and revenue framework. So the way we would think about it is very similar to other types of, of power projects, but with a, you know, a higher DSCR to account for the additional resource risk here. So as opposed to thinking, well, the whole entire project costs $100, and so therefore I will fund 75 or 80 percent of it. It really depends on, you know, what is your contracted cash flow over time? How, what's the duration of your contract, and you know, what's the applicable DSCR that you know the lender thinks is reasonable to apply there? So that could end up it could end up ranging as opposed to just a percentage of total capital cost. So, would you be using loan life cover ratios and field life cover ratios in the same way that you would in oil and gas projects? Uh, yeah, more similar, yeah, so similar to, you know, oil and gas and also, you know, similar to, you know, solar and wind, but, you know, the, the, the debt service coverage ratio or, you know, which is the, which is the credit metric that we most commonly look at and, and use, um, you know, would, would vary depending on the resource risk of the asset. Okay. And so, Ivan, is it different now you've got, if you like, some government uh, support? I mean, can, can you, can you stretch the, uh, the envelope a bit more uh, or are you as rigorously, uh, uh, you know, linked to uh, yeah. cash flow? For us, it's, yeah, for us, it, yeah, it's, it's about the same as as, uh, as Catherine explains. Yeah. Um, but you shouldn't take our government uh, insurance too seriously, because only the reservoir until a P90 model um, appears to be insured. So all risks during operations are not insured by this mechanism. It's just whether the drill drilling bit hits a reservoir, P90 heat or not. Yeah. That's really um, what, what, what it is about. The talking about uh, yeah, depth sizing in our country, direct use, we need um, 15 years PPAs, so 10 or 15 years. Also our um, subsidy scheme per megawatt hour is based on a 15 year subsidy tenor. 
Uh, and, and typically our leverages are at 30 until 40% equity. So 30, 70 is the leverage to 40, 60. That's about the range geothermal, geothermal projects are. Whereas for example, in wind and solar, it's about 10, 10, 90. So why is that? So the, the leverage, well, because uh, solar and wind are much more stable more predictive um you've got all kinds of product guarantees um and 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 geothermal you you have less or none on that side so we from a bank perspective need to have a, a more comfortable leverage and also higher dscr ratios are needed compared to solar and wind much higher is that depending on location? Like in uh, Dominica, after the hurricane, they at least uh, evaluated that uh, geothermal would be a good resource because it was more stable towards uh, climate change and uh, climate and weather conditions. So is it uh, you know, universal or does it matter where you are located? Well, when it works, it is a perfect base load technology. But um, yeah, as like I explained in the beginning, corrosion, erosion, um, yeah, other but that issues is arise very... during operations, which 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 make that we need to to provide extra depth for workovers for repairs. Um, and in solar and wind, we 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 hardly see them. You finance the entire project at the start, but you hardly have to 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 refinance or restructure or provide extra depth during the operations of a, of a project during the tenor of our loan. Okay. Uh, so but, I we mean, are that very also... happy yet that we have very high uh, standards on DSCL ratio, uh, ratios mm -hmm. and leverage. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. yeah, sorry. I think it's, uh, no, I'm saying it's uh, very common to say, I mean, in Holland, you have the same resources in France, but I mean, even between wells within the same field, you can have the difference, yeah. corrosion factor. So, I mean, you need to do your homework. And like Gillian, I think, mentioned in the beginning, like the GRMF has made sure that at least some uh, initial work is done properly uh, so that people are coming a little bit more prepared when they are seeking finance and seeking insurance. So I think it, that is a key factor in everything. We've got only progressively 12 to 15 minutes left and uh, I'm trying and I'm, I'm scanning down a list of questions that our audience have, um, have provided for us. Um, but while I'm scanning down that list, can I ask you please to debate this issue of standards because all of you say things like uh, our, our opinion of P90 or our, our opinion of the subsurface risk of delineation. And, and I'm wondering, uh, how, what, who are you relying on or what standards are you relying upon to opine as to whether this particular project is P90 or P50? So while I read through these questions, can you, can one of you pitch in and the others come in after that? I think, I mean, uh, United Nations certificate. Uh, oh, right, right, yeah, yeah. The, yeah the, they, have made a, yeah they have made a, 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 a standard that should be applied compare all renewable energy. And they have incorporated geothermal into that. Uh, I think it? that would, sorry. Who, who is using it? Not many, I think, but it is increasing. It, 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 is, becoming a, it is becoming a requirement in, in projects. Ah, right, that does it. So you're saying the World Bank will, you know, when you're talking about your list of, of how, do you, how do you make a project ready for the board, you need to have some sort of a, a resource standard applied to uh, to the heat resource or the power resource. Is that is that what you're saying? Currently, currently, it's not a requirement, but it is increasing in the in the project that it is done by that. Also, by financier to require that it's done, but it's not it's not uh, widely used yet. But hopefully, at least it would provide some kind of standard throughout the industry. I love it. I love it. I mean, it's, it's based on PRMS 2007. What about what about Ivan and uh, and, and Katie and Julia? What, what what are you using? Are you using uh, the United Nations standard or something else? And then we have. Sorry, Julia. Go ahead. Please. Go ahead, Ivan. Go we're, ahead. 
we were not. Uh, we we work with the clients, and so long as we agree it in advance, we 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 can be flexible. Um, it's not our role to set standards, but it's it is important to know what you're working to. Right? Hmm. And then we've got a software provided by I think yes to the government. It's called Dublet Calc, and that might I don't know matter whether it is, but I can imagine that it. Uh, taps in on the United Nations standard, maybe. But it's a, a quite common software product, and uh, also the government who decides on the who decides on the on the, the granting of the subsidies for megawatt hour. They use the same tool with their own geologists, so they assess the expected P90, and then in yeah, very often we have a third assessor who again looks at a P90 model and so yeah you get a some kind of a common ground what the expected p90 uh, would be yeah okay katie what about goldman sachs so i mean ba ba banks you know bankers are typically not engineers i mean they may have may have engineering degrees in a, in a past life but uh you know generally ba banks uh you know banks that are lending or you know um if you were to issue a bond the bond investors would re really rely on the independent en engineers report, which would be, you know, part of the a critical piece of the diligence package. And the independent engineer will have a software program or a way of, of looking at P50, P90. Um, but I, you know, I think that as the World Bank or, you know, multilaterals, if they start adopting UN 2016 as a standard, I think that the broader market will start to coalesce around that yeah. um, as, as a way to, to look at this. Okay, we're not we're not there yet, but there's a there's a, a clear feeling that this is the logical and right thing to do is to have a common standard, or maybe 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 more than one. Look at and reading out some of these questions we've got from our audience. Um, here's one uh, for anybody. What about co-production projects, hydrocarbons and geothermal energy, or geothermal and CCUS, or geothermal and lithium? Has anybody got any experience of that, or you've not experienced any opinions on on trying to fund these uh, co-projects? I, th I think one one interesting thing, and if you talk, if I'll just take, I'll pick the last one of those mentioned as the example, you know, geothermal and, and lithium. Yeah. You introduce project on project risk uh, if you're going to use the geothermal project to, you know, to power something else, or you're going to use the geothermal project for some other purpose. Um, I mean, that I think that in that way it makes it, you know, even more complicated than what we've been discussing, uh, been discussing here. Um, so interesting question that was posed. But it will add revenue streams to the to the developers. Would that not have a positive impact? Well, if you think about if you think about how um, you know if you're you're using the geothermal project to power like some an associated lithium project as a debt provider, um, mm -hmm. you know you're exposed to the performance of that second project as opposed to just selling the power you know to a utility. No, uh, which is, not you know, Sorry, they're not talking about using the geothermal power to for the lithium. They're talking about extracting lithium from the geothermal fluids. So you could have you... buy the power plant and then you have the residual fluids that are coming out of the power plant that you could extract other uses like lithium extraction or greenhouses or other. So you have you have a combined heat and power plant, so to say, or combined power and uh, Lithium extraction plant. Lithium, yeah. Your lithium extraction project still needs to generate revenue somehow, versus if, which is inherently more complicated than if you had a utility offtake that has an A credit rating, which is easier for banks to diligence. Okay. So well, I think, yeah, sorry, Dillian, you go ahead. Well, I, I, I think um, some of these dual use uh, projects may be uh, really interesting to look at in some of the emerging markets where there's high energy high entropy projects, uh, you know, in the East African Rift Valley in Kenya, particularly uh, combining it with to make green hydrogen. I mean, Casey does make a, an important point. It is sort of adding project risks. You've got to make the geothermal project work and and the and the hydrogen um, solution work. Um, but, you know, that is something we as a, a sector need to be able to deal with that complexity. Uh, and find ways to you know, bring in these additional reven revenue streams. Um, and I think as we see uh, you know, more you know, government engagement in, in the international action on climate change at Paris, 
is there, you know, is the Paris Accord going to be able to create a market where you can get properly um, compensated for you know, creating green hydrogen from geothermal projects and allow Kenya to meet its uh, climate change uh, commitments and so on. I think that'll be really interesting to explore. But I would also be interested in, I mean, there has also been talk about industrial parks. So you have either the power plant or you have the power from the grid and you utilize the heat for industrial parks. So you have various uh, revenue streams for your uh, geothermal utilization. You can have a, a dairy farm, you can have, a, you know, or you can have a, a you know, spa or a greenhouse yeah. or all of these re different revenue streams. Are you saying that would be more difficult to uh, finance than uh, a normal project where you would have, you usually also have more simple, when you have a direct use, you have more simple uh, above ground uh, equipment than for power plants. So are you saying it would be more difficult because you have more revenue streams or is it uh, equally difficult to finance? Uh, if you, first, if you it is more difficult at first in the first years until there are sufficient projects who have proven themselves because you have all kinds of, of changes in these revenue streams and I don't know but in, in, in the Netherlands I'm not a chemist but um, we have experience that just from releasing the CO2 from depressurizing the fluids change so the specs of the fluids change which led to problems in the uh, in the injection side. We had all kind of crystallization of other um, uh, uh, substances, uh, bacteria clogging. So I, I don't know what the extraction of lithium, be it that it is very interesting. I, I sometimes read about in England is going on, I think in, in, um, in the Alsace. So very interesting developments, but at first in order on the, on the financing side, I think it's it's more difficult in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, I'm really yeah. sorry. I've just, we've just been given a five minute um, note, if you like, to say we, we've got to wrap up. Although I am always tempted, anybody who knows me, and running over and over. But let's let's try and keep roughly to <laughs> roughly to time. And so, what I'd like like you to do, uh, if you wouldn't mind, each is try is to spend a minute on or so on the. On the kind of the, the kind of thoughts you want to leave this audience of everybody from government officials to small companies trying to develop their first project, you know, uh, just just try and think of uh, some remarks you want to make. I don't know, Elon, you start, and then Ivan, uh, if you fancy, or if you don't, if it doesn't come to your mind, anybody pitch in and start and say something, um, and uh, let's just gently wrap it up. Regrettably, really regrettably, but uh, who wants to say something about about just a kind of ending piece? I'll say something, we, you know, we've identified some challenges for, for the industry. And, and yes, it's not, e not, not uh, easy, but, uh, you know, we have some really important sustainable development goals that we need to deliver. Uh, and one of those uh, SDGs is uh, number 17, it's partnerships. Uh, and I think geothermal really ha industry has to work on those partnerships, you know, across you know, the multilaterals, the debt providers, the equity providers, the insurance industry, the engineers, you know, the oil and gas sector, bringing their expertise to, to the industry. Um, uh, and partnerships are, are going to be key. And it's getting that, that capital stru structure right uh, and the business model right. So, you know, yes, uh, Kenny makes a good point about, you know, project risk on project risk is not necessarily attractive, but there's got to be ways to to do that uh, and we have to have a longer term vision as an industry uh, to make, make it work uh, and recognize the sustainable development benefits geothermal can deliver, uh, particularly in these uh, emerging market territories. As I say, we've done a lot of work in, in East Africa. We'd love to see the geothermal sector expand there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an opportunity for those countries to start building out other technologies and uh, other products and exports rather than it's importing fossil fuels maybe they can start exporting hydrogen and, and start becoming uh you know powerhouses in that economy brilliant anyone else want to say anything you want to say here here so nothing to add really uh, to julian thank you 
Yeah, I've maybe I'd like to, I've, I found it really interesting discussions and uh, and uh, I think you know there is no one solution fits all and there is no one renewable energy source that will solve all of the problems or all of the energy we need to uh, you know get to renewable in the future. So I mean we will need all of the renewable energy technology we have and so I think it is a I think that it's a it's been very interesting. Thank you. Katie, do you want to, do you want the last word? You know, Tim, I think it's been well covered by everybody else. Um, but yeah, I think energy energy transition and uh, you know you know renewable energy is on uh, you know topics worldwide on everyone's mind. So um, glad that we could all come together here to discuss some potential solutions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I, I thank you guys so much. It was, I mean, it's been really interesting getting to know you and I know this relationship will go on afterwards. Um, I'm waiting for the first billion dollar uh, geothermal project. And then I kind of know that once we can get to oil and gas type scales, that, that we will be able to roll this thing out and uh, and finally put a proper argument against the IEA's policy documents uh, where they really didn't see much of a future for, uh, for geothermal in 2050. Uh, but, I just have to thank you all very much indeed for uh, for educating me and a fascinating discourse and uh, and I hope this relationship continues uh, into the years ahead and uh, I thank uh, Touchcast uh, for ably uh, managing us all and the time um, and uh, I guess with that I should uh, ask our audience uh, uh, to wait on for the next session and to uh, thank you all very much for your attention and uh, with that uh, I wish you all Good night from the UK and I'm sure good afternoon from other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you.